Welcome to the Yemen Platform Podcast, brought to you by Neptune AI, the show where Piotr Niedwiedzie and Aurimas Gricinas, together with top MLOps practitioners, explore the world of internal ML platforms and MLOps stack components. Today we brought Mikiko Baisley from FeatureFall to talk about learnings from building the ML platform at MailChimp. Yeah, so the virtual feature store paradigm, we kind of try to take the best of like both worlds. I think MLOps engineers and like data engineers sometimes, they, um, they think too much like engineers. I've heard of a teams that the only job of the team was just baking new template repositories daily, basically, to support like 300 use cases. And, and I think with uh, generative AI type of problems, it is even more challenging because the feedback is, is less structured. Now on to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Machine Learning Platform podcast. Today, I'm your host, Aurimas, and together with me, uh, there's a co-host, Piotr Nedvic, who is a co-founder and CEO of Neptune AI. And together with us today on the episode is our guest, Mickey Baisley. Uh, Mickey is a very well-known figure in the data community. She is currently a head of MLOps at FeatureForm, a virtual feature store. Before that, she was building machine learning platforms at uh, MailChimp. Um, nice to have you here, Mickey. Yeah, so I mean, you, you definitely got the, um, the details correct. Um, yeah, so I joined FeatureForm uh, last October. And before that, I uh, was, was with MailChimp uh, on their ML platform team. Uh, I was there uh, before and after the, the big Intuit, uh, was it? $14 billion acquisition or something like that. So uh, was was there during the handoff. Uh, quite fun, quite fun, quite quite chaotic at times. Uh, but prior to that, uh, yeah, I've spent a number of years working both as a, a data analyst, data scientist, and even a weird like ML ops, ML platform data engineer role for um, some early stage startups where I was like trying to build out like their platforms. Uh, for machine learning and realize that's actually very hard when you're like a five person startup. So uh, lots of lessons learned there. Uh, But yeah, but yeah, so I tell people, honestly, I've spent like last eight years working up and down like the data and ML value chain effectively. A fancy way for calling it job hopping. But um, yeah, so that's me. And Mickey, you, you, you've been data scientist, right? At the same and you were later MLOps like engineer, let's let's call it this way. Mm-hmm. I know that you are not necessarily a big fan of titles. You rather prefer to, you know, talk what yes. you actually uh, do. But uh, it is quite not common combination, I would say. Uh, how did you manage, you know, like to jump from more analytical, scientific type of role to more engineering one. Yeah, and and to be honest, like um, most people are really surprised to hear that, you know, my background in college was not computer science. And I actually did not pick up Python until about maybe a year before I made the transition to a data scientist role. Uh, so when I was in college, I actually had studied anthropology and economics. I was very interested with the way people worked because to be frank, I didn't understand how people worked. So that seemed like the logical, uh, areas of study. And, but, and I was always fascinated by the way people kind of made decisions, especially in a group. Um, you know, what are like, like cultural or social norms that we just kind of think and accept, um, so when I graduated college, actually, I my first job was working at a hair salon, working as like a front desk girl. So at that point, I didn't have any programming skills. Uh, I think I had like one class in R for biostats, which I barely passed, um, not because of intelligence or, um, you know, ambition, but mainly because I just didn't understand like the roadmap. I didn't understand the process of how to make that kind of pivot. And so essentially 
you know, my first pivot was from like data science to actually like growth operations and sales hacking uh, was what it was called growth hacking at the time in Silicon Valley. And then I kind of like just developed a playbook for how to make these transitions. So I was able to get from uh, growth hacking to then data analytics, data analytics to data science, and then data science to ML ops. And I think the the key ingredients of making that transition from data science to um, an ML ops engineer was one, having like a really genuine desire for the kinds of problems that uh, I want to solve and work on. And that's just kind of how I've always like focused my career was like, what's the problem I want to work on today? And do I think it's going to be interesting like one or two years from now? And then the second part was, um, I think it's very interesting because I actually, there, there was one year where I actually had four jobs. I was working as a data scientist. I was mentoring at two boot camps, and then I was working on uh, a real estate tech startup on the weekends, uh, which was not, and then I eventually left to go work on it full time during the pandemic, which was maybe, it, it was a very, uh, it was a great learning experience, but financially might not have been the best solution uh, to get paid in sweat equity, but that's okay, right? Sometimes you, you have to kind of like follow your passion a little bit. Um, you have to like follow your interest. Uh, when it comes to you know like decisions in like in my context, I remember um, when I was uh, still student, I, like I, I started from tech. So yeah, my first job was internship uh, at Google as software engineer. Mm. I'm from Poland, and I remember when I got an offer from Google to to join as a regular software engineer. The monthly salary was more than I was spending in a year in a year mm. in Poland as students, two times or three times more, um, and it is very it is very tempting, you know, to to follow where money is at the given moment. But and and I see a lot of people in the field, especially at the beginning of their career, they rather think more short term because the difference in earnings is so significant at yeah. the beginning but this concept of looking few steps few uh, few years ahead i think it's something that that people are missing and and it is something that by the end of the day may may result in better outcomes and and i always ask myself when when there's decision like that okay if in a year, what would happen if in a year it is a you know failure? I am not happy. Can I go back and basically pick up this uh, the other option? And usually the answer is yes, you can. Uh, so yeah. Um, I ended, yeah, like I, I know that decisions like that are challenging, but but I think that uh, you made the right call and and you should follow you should follow passion and plus. Think about where this passion is leading. Yeah, absolutely. I'm also. I also have a very similar, I would say, background. So I switched from uh, analytics to data science, then to machine learning, then to data engineering, then to MLOps. But for me, it was a little bit of a longer journey because I kind of had data engineering and cloud engineering and DevOps engineering in between, and you shifted straight from data science, if I understand correctly. How do you did you bridge that technical? I would call it a technical uh, chasm, right? That is needed to become a, a MLOps engineer. Yeah, absolutely. And that was part of the the work at the early stage uh, real estate startup. And because, uh, so I'd gone through, something I'm a very big fan of is boot camps. So I know for me, when I graduated college, I had a very bad GPA. Very, very bad. Uh, I don't know how they do the G, like how did, how they score a grade in uh, Europe, but in the US, for example, right, it's usually out of like a 4.0 system. And I had a 2.4. Like that is just considered very, very bad, like by most US standards. So I, I didn't have the opportunity to go back to a grad program and a master's program. Um, and especially in like, it was very interesting because by that point I had like six years maybe working with um, executive level leadership for companies like Autodesk, um, you know, Teladoc, uh, you know, companies that are either very well known globally 
um, or at least like very, very well known domestically, like within the US. And I had like sea level, you know, people saying like, hey, the CTR is CFO going like, hey, we will write you those like letters to get to grad program. And grad programs are like, sorry, nope, you have to go back to college to redo your GPA. I'm like, I am in my late 20s. Like, not only is it expensive, I'm not going to do that. Uh, so I'm a big fan of boot camps. So uh, what helped me both in transition to the data scientist role and then also to um, the all like ops engineer role was uh, doing uh, a combination of like a boot camp. And also when I was going to the ML ops engineer role, I also took this one uh, workshop that's pretty well known called the full stack deep learning. Um, it's taught by Dimitri and uh, Josh Tobin, um, who went off to go start Gantry. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. And for me, but, but at the end of the day, like I think sometimes people go into boot camps thinking that's going to like get them a job and it just really doesn't. It's, it's just a very structured, you know, accelerated learning format. Uh, what helped me in both of those transitions truly was one, like investing in like my, my mentor relationship. So for example, when I first pivoted from data science to, or so data analytics to data science, uh, my mentor at that time was uh, Rajiv Shah, who is the developer advocate at Hugging Face now. Uh, but I, you know, mentors at boot camps, and, I, and I've been a mentor at a boot camp since then, uh, at a couple of them. A lot of times students will kind of check in and they'll be like, oh, why don't you help me grade my project? How was my code? And that's like a very, um, it's it's not a high value way of like leveraging an industry mentor, especially when they come with like such credentials like Rajiv Shah came with. Um, and then with the full stack deep learning course, of course, there were like some TAs there that were absolutely amazing. So what I did was, yeah, I showed them my project for grading, but I was also like, uh, for example, when moving to the data scientist role, I was asking Rajiv Shah, okay, like how do I do like model interpretability? If my marketing, uh, if my CMO is asking me to, you know, create a forecast, predict results. How do I get this model in production? Um, how do I get buy-in for these data science projects? Like, how do I leverage the strengths that I already have? Um, and then couple that with like the technical skills I'm developing. I did the same thing with the ML like platform role was like, okay, what is this course like not teaching me right now that I really should be learning? How do I develop my uh, body of work? How do I fill in these gaps? So I think it's it's a combination, right? You need to have, yes, the structured, you know, curriculum, but you also need to have projects to like work with, like even if they are sandbox projects, but like that kind of gives you, that exposes you to like a lot of the problems, right? In developing like ML systems. And when you, when you uh, mentioned boot uh, mentors, did you find them during boot camps or you had other way to find mentors. How does it work? Yeah. So with most boot camps, um, well, so that that comes down to like picking the right boot camp. Honestly, uh, for me, I chose Springboard for my data science transition, and then I use them a little bit for the transition to the ML ops role. But I actually relied a little bit more heavily on full stack deep learning and a lot of independent like study and work too. Um, I didn't finish the springboard one for the ML ops one because I'd gotten a couple job offers by that point for like four or five different companies for an ML ops in general. And was it because of bootcamp or do you, because you said many people use bootcamps to find job, how did it work in your case? You said it was not the main goal, but so how did you go, got those offers? Well, so for the bootcamp, so they didn't, they didn't like put me, um, in contact with like, you know, hiring managers, right. They didn't do that. Um, what I did do was, and this is where like having like public branding comes into play. Uh, I don't necessarily think I'm like, I definitely don't think I'm an influencer. Like for one thing, I just don't have the audience size for that. But what you I do, you, you do, you what, do. What I do try to do, no. <laughs> what, but what I do try to do, very similar to you know what a lot of the folks here right now um, on the path podcast do, is I I do try to like share my learnings with people, 
uh, I tried to like take my experiences and then really kind of frame them up in a like, okay, uh, yes, this, this kind, these kinds of things can happen, but this is also how you can kind of like deal with it. Um, I think like building in public and sharing that learning was just so crucial for me to get a job. I, I see so many of these job seekers, especially on like the MLOps side or the ML engineer side, you see them all the time where their headline is like data science, machine learning, Java, Python, SQL, or um, blockchain, computer vision, da da da. It's like- Blockchain, not anymore <laughs> in the classroom. I know, I know. And it's like, but they're not, right, right. It's like, it's like two things, right? One, they're not training their LinkedIn profile as like a website landing page, because that's basically what it is. Right. It's like treat your landing page well, and then you might actually like retain like, you know, visitors uh, similar to like a website or a SaaS product. Uh, but more importantly, they're not actually doing the important thing uh, that you do with social networks, which is you have to actually engage with people. You have to like share with folks. Uh, you have to, you know, like produce like your learnings. So as I was going through the boot camps, that's what I would essentially do was I would just like, as I learned stuff, I would combine that with my, and as I was working on projects, I would combine that with like my experiences and I would like just share it out in public. And I would just try to be really, um, I don't want to say authentic. That's a little bit of an overused term. Uh, but there's like the saying, right? Like interesting people are interested. You have to be interested in like the problems and the 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 people and the solutions around you. And then people can, can connect with that. If you're just kind of like faking it, then it's, if you're faking it with no substance, I feel like a lot of like chat GPT and like gen AI folks are faking it with no substance, but that's, you know, but you need to like have that real interest and you need to have something with it. Right. And so that's, that's how I did that. Like, and I think most people don't do that. There is one more factor mm. that is needed. I am struggling with it when it comes to sharing, uh, because yeah, like uh, I'm learning mm. different stuff, but once I learn it, then it sounds, then it's for me kind of obvious. And then I'm kind of <laughs> yeah, in a shame that maybe it is too obvious. So yeah, like le let's wait for something more sophisticated to share. It never comes. No. <laughs> so yeah, like. I do think everyone has that. <laughs> uh, GitLab has this. Imposter syndrome. Culture of low level of shame. Yeah. Need to get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, I think uh I don't I don't know. Like Remus, do you do you feel like you ever get rid of imposter syndrome? I don't no, no, feel no, like never, I, never. Yeah, I just find never. ways around it. <laughs> like just, everything, you know, just go, okay, yeah. what's this? Everything everything that I post I think it's uh, not necessarily worth our people's time, but uh, it looks like it is. <laughs> oh, <No, laughs> so. it's great. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, it's almost like you just have to set up things to get around your like worst nature, right? Like all your, like all your um, insecurities. Like you just have to trick yeah, you have to trick around yourself, like a good diet and workout. <laughs> Miki, which is head of MLOps at FeatureForm, and actually had uh, once I had a chance to talk with CEO of FeatureForm, and I he did leave me with a good impression. So. Uh, about the mm. product. So what is feature form and uh, how is it product. different? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, the first one, the first one, but uh, usually uh, these talks are more about the product rather than uh, selling yourself, right? So yeah. Uh, how is it, uh, how is feature form different from, let's say, others, ever players in feature store industry now? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it comes down to like understanding uh, like the different types of feature stores that are out there and even understanding why like a virtual feature store is maybe just a terrible name for what feature form is like, like category wise. It's, it's very like not, um, it's very not descriptive. Uh, okay. So the three types of feature stores and interestingly, they kind of roughly correspond also to, I think the, the waves of ML ops too, of like how like different um, paradigms in the tools have developed. Uh, so the three types are the literal, physical, and the virtual. So let's talk about like the literal, because I think everyone understands that intuitively. Uh, a literal feature store is just literally a feature store. It will store the features 
both uh, the definitions and the values, and then it will serve the features. That that's kind of pretty much all it does. It's like a very special. It's almost if it's almost like a very specialized like data storage solution. Um, so, for example, an example of that would be Feast. Feast is a virtual. Uh, Feast is a literal feature store. Um, and that it's it's a very lightweight option. Um, you know, you can also um, implement it very easily. Uh, implementation risk is is low, right? Because you're essentially not. There's no transformation. There's no orchestration or computation going on. This was surprising. So why it's lightweight? I understand that uh, mm -hmm. literal feature store stores mm -hmm. features. So it's it's kind of replace your storage, right? Yeah, well, so when I say lightweight, I mean, like, if you find implementing Postgres, like that kind of lightweight. So technically, it's not super lightweight. Uh, but if we put on a spectrum compared to like a physical feature store. So a physical feature store is like, it has everything. It is It stores features, it serves them, but it also will orchestrate and do the transformations. Uh, it A lot of times, so the physical feature store, that is very, very, like, a heavyweight and that's why I think of on a, on a spectrum in terms of both like implementation and maintenance um, and administration. So on the spectrum, the physical is the heaviest. Yes, uh, absolutely. Literal, like the transformations are done somewhere else and, and saved yes. back to literal, okay? Yes. And the feature store yes, itself yep. is just, uh, just a lot, it's just a library, right? The feature store, first of all, feature store is just a library, right? Which is basically uh, performing actions against storage, correct? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, well, yes. A uh, literal feature store. Well, that's almost like an implementation detail. But yeah, like for the most part, like Feast, for example, is is a library um, and they, they provide you a different like providers. Right. So. Um, you, you, you can do configure have a it uh, against, against. Yeah, you can configure yeah. it against S3, against uh, DynamoDB, against uh, Redis. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And the, absolutely, the absolutely. weakness comes, I guess, from it being just a thin library on top of this storage. 100%. And you manage the storage yourself, right? 100%. So there is no yep. backend, there is no component there, that stores metadata there, about this feature, feature store? Uh, well, the literal feature store, all it does in a way is just store features in like metadata. It won't actually do any of like, the heavy lifting of the transformation or the orchestration. So what is right. then virtual? Because uh, I got yep. what is physical. This is yep. quite clear. But yep, curious, yep. what is virtual then? Yeah, so the virtual feature store paradigm, we kind of try to take the best of like both worlds. So something that, to say, like there is a use case for the different types of feature stores, right? Like the physical feature stores, they came out of Companies like Uber, like Twitter, like Airbnb, they were solving like really gnarly problems when it came to like processing like huge amounts of data um, in like a streaming fashion. So, but the challenge is with like, so the physical feature stores, you're pretty locked down to like your provider or the provider they choose. Uh, you can't actually swap out. For example, if you wanted to use um, Cassandra, Redis, versus like, as your what we call like the inference store or the online store, uh, you can't actually do that usually with a physical feature store. Usually, a physical one, they you kind of just take whatever providers they give you. So it's almost like another like specialized like data process, like a data processing and storage solution. So with the virtual feature store, we try to take the flexibility of like a literal fees like feature store where you can essentially like swap out providers. You can use BigQuery. You can use, um, uh, yeah, like you can use BigQuery. You can use uh, like AWS. You can use like Azure. If you want to use different inference stores, you've got that. Um, so, but what we do is we focus on what we think are like the actual problems that like feature stores are meant to solve which is not just versioning, not just uh, documentation and metadata management, and not just serving, but also like the orchestration of transformations. Um, so for example, with feature form, like we do this because we are Kubernetes native, right? So we're assuming that data scientists for the most part don't want to write transformations elsewhere. 
they probably want to be able to do stuff like they normally would do with like Python, with SQL, with like like Spark uh, flavor, like PySpark with data frames. So we assume they want to do that. They just want to be able to like, for example, like wrap their like features in like a decorator style or like write it as a class style if they want to. And they kind of like shouldn't have to do the infrastructure side. Like they shouldn't have to provide all this fancy configuration and have to like figure out what the path to production is. And so we try to also make that like as streamlined and simple as possible. The idea is that you have a new data scientist that joins the team and like everyone's experience this, right? Like you go to a new company and you basically just spend like the first three months trying to look for like documentation and confluence. You're like reading people's like Slack channels to be like, what exactly did they do with this like forecasting and like churn project? You're hunting down the data. Uh, you find out that the queries are broken and you're like, God, what were they thinking about this? And then like a leader comes to you and they're like, oh yeah, by the way, like the numbers are wrong. You gave me these numbers and they've changed. And you're like, oh shoot, now I need like lineage. Oh God, I need to track. Oh, and then the, the part that really hurts law of enterprises right now is regulation. So in Europe, uh, that's in any company that does business in Europe, right? It's GDPR is a big one. But a lot of medical companies in the US, for example, uh, they're under HIPAA, which is for um, medical and like health companies. Uh, so for a lot of them, they have to like, oddly enough, lawyers are very involved in the ML process. Most people don't realize this. But in the enterprise space, like lawyers are the ones who like, for example, they get a lawsuit or new regulation comes out and they, they need to go like, OK, can I like track what features are being used in what models? So those kinds of uh, like workflows are the things that like we're really trying to solve with the virtual feature store paradigm. Um, it's just like making sure that when a data scientist is doing feature engineering, which is like the really the most heavy and intensive part of the data science process, they don't have to go to all these different places, learn new languages, uh, you know, when like the feature engineering part is already like so hard. So, uh, Miki, if I may, uh, so from, I will look at this from two perspectives, from um, maybe administrator perspective, somebody who, let's say we are going to deploy virtual feature store uh, in, in, as part of our tech stack. So I, I need to have storage like S3 or BigQuery, as you said, I would need to have infrastructure to com to perform computations. It can be a cluster run by Kubernetes, maybe something else. Anyway, virtual feature store is an abstraction on top of storage and compute uh, component. Yeah, yeah. So we actually... Um... I did a talk at Data Council and we had released uh, what we thought was like, we call it a market map, but that's not that's not actually quite correct. Uh, so we had actually kind of released um, a, a diagram of what we think is like the, the ML stack, uh, like architecture. So the way we look at it is like, okay, so you have a computation storage, right? Which is just... Uh, things that run across like every team it doesn't it these are not like what we call like layer zero layer one these are not necessarily like ml concerns because you need com computation storage right to like run an e-commerce website so we'll use that an e-commerce website as an example right um then the layer above that is when you have like the providers or for example for a lot of folks, like if you're a solo data scientist, maybe you just need access to like GPUs for machine learning models. Uh, maybe you really like to use like Spark and uh, you know, you have your other serving providers. So at that part, that's where we start seeing like a little bit of the differentiation um, for like ML problems. Underneath that, you might also have like Kubernetes, right? Because that also might be doing the orchestration for the full company. So the virtual feature store like goes above your um your like spark in ray and um your like databricks offering for example now above that though like 
and we're seeing this now with like for example the the mid-size space there's a lot of folks who've been publishing like amazing um descriptions of their like ml system so for example shopify published a blog post about merlin um there's like a few other folks i think doordash has also published some really good stuff um now people are also starting to look at what we call these like unified ml ops frameworks and that's where you have like for example like your zen ml um there's a few others that are like in that top layer but yeah so the virtual feature store would actually fit in between like your unified ml ops framework and then your actual like providers like uh daybreak spark all that and then below that would be like kubernetes and ray and from okay so it is from um, architectural perspective uh it's how it uh, looks but what about end user perspective I assume that end user of a feature store, at least one of the persona would be data scientist. So how as a data scientist, I would interact with the feature store, virtual feature store. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So ideally the interaction would be, I don't want to say it would be minimal. So you would use it the way to the extent that you'd use like GitHub or Git. Um, we try to make it su like, so the principle is make it really easy for people to do the right thing. Um, something I learned when I was at MailChimp from uh, the staff engineer that and the tech lead for my team was um, assume positive intent, which I think is just like such a lovely guiding principle. I think a lot of times there's this kind of weird antagonism between like ML and ML slash ML ops engineers and data scientists where it's like, and even like software engineers and data scientists where it's like, Oh, data scientists are like, are, are just terrible at coding. They're terrible people. Like how awful are they? Uh, and then of course the data scientists are like looking at like the DevOps engineers or the platform engineers going like, why do you create, why do you constantly create like really bad abstractions and like really leaky APIs that make it so hard for us to just do our job? Like most data scientists just do not care about infra. And if they do care about infra, they are just, they are ML ops engineers in training. They are on the step to a new journey. Or, or when they have problems. <laughs> or when they have problems, which every ML ops engineer, right, has that, that story of like, oh God, I was trying to debug or troubleshoot uh, a pipeline or, oh God, like, you know, I had a Jupyter notebook or a pickled model and my company didn't have like the deployment, uh, you know, infrastructure. Like, I think that's the origin story of like every, every caped uh, ML ops engineer. Um, but yeah, I mean, so in terms of like the interaction, ideally, so essentially the data scientists shouldn't have to be setting up, like they shouldn't have to be setting up the Spark cluster. What they do need is they just need like the credential information, which should be i don't want to say fairly easy to get but if it's really hard for them to get it from their um platform engineers then that is like maybe a sign of some deeper communication um issues uh but all they would just need to get is the credential information put it in a configuration file and then at that point uh we use the term like registering in feature form but essentially it's mostly like through decorators they just need to kind of tag like hey by the way, we're using these data sources. Uh, we're creating these features. Um, we're creating these training data sets. And then because we offer like versioning and for us, like we say features are um, a first class like immutable entity or a an ent uh, system, they provide a version and they never have to really worry about like writing over features or, you know, um, having features of like the same name if you have two data scientists that are working on like for the e-commerce example, they're doing a forecast, right? Uh, for customer lifetime value. And maybe it's like, uh, like spend the first like three months of like the customer's journey or what campaign they came through. If you have two data scientists that are working on the same logic, um, and they both like submit as long as the, the versions are named differently, both of them will be logged against that feature. Um, and that allows us to also provide the tracking and lineage, but we don't, yeah, like, so we, we help materialize the transformations, uh, but we won't like actually, like we won't store the data, right. For the features. 
So, Mickey, a question, because you used the term uh, decorator. The only decorator that that comes to my mind is a Python decorators. So we are talking about Python here, right? And so, uh, okay. And you also mentioned that we can version features. I understand that, but when it comes to uh, this concept of a data set as a set of samples, right? A sample consists of many features. So do you, like, would you also version data sets with feature store? So what is the glue between version features? How you would represent data set then? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we, um, we're not really, we don't, we don't version data sets. We'll version, uh, sources, which we also include features in that. Um, just because like with the understanding that like you can use features like as sources for like other models, um, for us, like you could use feature form with a tool like DVC that has come up multiple times. We're not really interested uh, in like versioning full data sets, uh, people can like, if they like, say for example, for sources, we can take tables or files. If people like made modifications to that source or, or uh, that table or that file, uh, they can log that as a variation and we'll keep track of those, but that's not really the goal. We want to focus more on like the feature engineering side. Um, and so what we do is we version the uh, definitions. So like every feature it consists of two components. It's like the values and the definition. Because we uh, create like these pure functions with feature form, the idea is that if you have the same input and you push it through like our, um, the definitions that we've like stored for you, and then we will transform it, you should ideally get the sa like the same output. So that's where we kind of sort of end. So if you would plug a, plug a machine learning pipeline after a feature store and you retrieve a data set, so it's already a pre-computed set of features that you save in your feature store, you probably need to provide a list of entity IDs like uh, all other feature stores require, correct? So you would version this entity ID list, basically, plus the computation logic, so the feature view version plus the source, equals uh, kind of a reproducible chunk. Would you do it like this or are there any other ways to approach this? Yeah, yeah, so let me just, uh, okay, so let me just resummarize the question back to you. Um, mm -hmm. So can we, so basically what you're actually asking is, can we reproduce, um, can we reproduce exact results? And how do we do that? For a training run, yeah. So like we don't version the 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 data set or necessarily the data input, right? We version the transformations. So in terms of um, the actual logic itself, so people can uh, they can register like individual features, but they can also like zip those features together with a label. And so what we guarantee is essentially like when you whatever you write for your like development uh, features. It's going to be the same exact logic will be mirrored for production. And we do that through our serving client in terms of like guaranteeing the input. That's where we kind of say like, Hey, you know, like there's so many tools to do that. We just don't feel like, and that's kind of the philosophy of the virtual feature store. A lot of like, I think early, the early waves of ML ops, they were really kind of solving the lower layers. Like, okay, how fast can we make this? Like, what's the throughput? What's like the um the lane c um we kind of don't for us we're like there's so many great options out there we don't really really need to focus on that um so instead we're we focus on like the parts that we've gone feedback is really hard so for example minimizing like train and serve skew and specifically minim minimizing it through um standardizing the the logic that's being used so that a data scientist isn't writing their like uh training pipeline in like Python and then having to like rewrite it in like Spark SQL or, or something like that. So that's kind of where we offer that. Um, I don't want to say guarantee for reproducibility, but that's where we try to at least like help out a lot. 
in terms of like the NCID, um, yeah, the way it works is essentially like if the the um, so we get like the NCID, for example, from like the front end team, right, as like an API call or whatever, um, and essentially like as long as that is the same, as long as the feature or the training set or sorry, the features they're calling is this, they're using like the right versions, they should get the same output. And that's that's some of the use cases that like uh, people have kind of told us about is like, for example, if they want to test out like different kinds of logic, they could create like different versions of the features, they could create different versions of the training sets, and they could essentially feed like version one, uh, let's say to one model, and then version one to another model, maybe it's the same model that was trained. And then they can do ablation studies to see like, okay, like which model performed well and which features did well. And then just like roll it back to the model that performed best. So uh, to sum up, uh, would, would you agree that when it comes to value that Feature Store brings to the tech stack of uh, ML team, it brings versioning of logic behind feature engineering. So if we have version logic for given set of features you, you want to use to train your model, and you would save somewhere pointer or to the source data that would be used to compute uh, more uh, specific features, then we are getting basically data sets versioning. So it is on one hand, you need to have the source data and you need to version it somehow, but also you need to version the logic that would process the more raw data and compute feature. I'd say the, the three or four main, like the three, three or four main like points of the value prop are definitely versioning, uh, versioning of the logic. Um, the second part is documentation. It's a huge, huge part. Uh, yeah, I think everyone's had that experience of like, they look at a project and you have no idea why someone, uh, chose the logic that they did. Uh, for example, to represent like customer, uh, like a contract value, right. For a sales pipeline. Uh, so versioning documentation, uh, transformation and orchestration. So you write once the way we say it is you write once serve twice. Uh, so that we offer that guarantee. And then, um, along with that or orchestration aspect, um, there is like, we offer things, for example, also like scheduling. Uh, but those are the three main things, versioning, documentation, uh, minimizing train serve skew through transformations. Uh, yeah, those are the three big ones, at least that people ask us for. How, how does the documenta uh, documentation part work? So there are two types of documentation, right? There is, um, I don't want to say, well, how do I want to say incidental documentation? So, th so there's documenting through code. Um, and then there is a doc, and then there is like doc assistive documentation, right? Um, so assistive documentation is like, for example, um, like doc strings, right? You can explain like, hey, this is the logic of the function. Um, these are what the terms mean, et cetera. So we offer that. Um, but then there's also like documenting through code as much as possible. So for example, um, you have to like list the version of like the feature or the training set or the source that you're using. So like try to break out like the type as well of like the resource that's essentially being created. Um, we also like, at, at least for like the, the managed version of a uh, feature form, we also ever like offer governance, like user access control and like things like that. We also offer like lineage as well of the features. Uh, for example, like linking it to like the model that's being used uh, with that feature. So we try to build in as much like, as much documentation on the like, code as documentation as much as possible. And then we're always looking at different ways that we can continue to like expand the capabilities of our of our dashboard um, to also assist with the like 
the assistive documentation. So not just doc strings, but what are other ways that like uh, like different members of like the ML lifecycle or the ML like team, um, both like the ones that are like obvious, like the MOPS engineer, data scientists, but even like the non-obvious people like lawyers, like how can they also um, have like visibility and access into like what features are being used and like with like what models? So those are the different kinds of like documentation that we offer. You have been before before joining Feature Form as a head of MLOps. You have been a machine learning operations engineer in mail, at Mailchimp, and you were helping to build the ML platform there, right? Uh, what kind of problems were the data scientists and machine learning engineers solving at Mailchimp? Yeah, so uh, there were a couple of things. So when I had joined uh, Mailchimp, the there was already some kind of like a platform team there. So it was a very interesting situation where the ML ops and like the ML platform uh, kind of concerns were like kind of roughly split across three teams. So there was a team that I was on where we were very intensely focused on making it on tools and setting up the environment for like development and training for data scientists. Uh, as well as like helping out with the, the actual productionization work, there is a team that was focused on really kind of like the serving of like the live service models. And then there was a team that was kind of constantly evolving. They started off as doing like data integrations and then they then became like the model monitoring team. And, and, and that's kind of where they were like when I left. Um, so Generally speaking, like across all teams, uh, the problems that we were trying to solve was uh, one, um, how to provide paths to productionization for data science set MailChimp, given like all the different kinds of projects they were working on. So, for example, MailChimp was like the first place I had seen where they had a strong use case from a for business value for generative AI, uh, and that's actually oddly enough the company where I, I benchmark. Anytime a company comes out with generative AI capabilities, that's the company I actually benchmark against is MailChimp, uh, just because like they had such a strong use case for it. Feels like a great moment to interrupt the show and give you a 30 seconds pitch of Neptune AI. Okay, so we help with model metadata storage and management. That means you can log model metadata from anywhere in your pipeline and see the results in the web app. Organize and display it however you want. Search, debug, and compare experiments, datasets, and models. Save your production-ready models to a centralized registry and collaborate on your projects across the org. Oh, and we integrate with pretty much any MLOps stack. Just plug us in. For more, go to Neptune AI. Or check our docs. They're pretty good. I hope write them. Hope it was 30 seconds. Back to the show. Was it uh, content generation? Mickey, can you share the please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it's helpful to understand the what MailChimp is. So... Most people, so additional context. So MailChimp is a 20 year old company. Uh, it's based in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, part of the reason why it was bought out for so much money was because uh, number it's, it's also the largest, I don't wanna say provider. They have the largest email list in the US uh, because they are an, e they start off as an email marketing solution um, but what most people I, I think are not super aware of is that for the last couple of years, they have been making big moves into, um, becoming sort of like the all in one shop for like small, medium size, uh, businesses who want to do e-commerce. So they're still email marketing. That's a huge part of what they do. So NLP, very, very big there, uh, obviously, um, but they also offer things, for example, like uh, like social media content creation. Um, they also offer uh, an e-commerce, like a virtual digital website uh, for their small, medium-sized businesses. And they essentially tried to create themselves as like the front-end CRM for, uh, you know, small, medium-sized businesses. Um, essentially, they were bought by Intuit to become the front-end to Intuit's like back-of-house operations which is like QuickBooks, TurboTax, uh, all those things. So with that context, right, the goal of MailChimp 
is we need to make the uh the marketing stuff that is like things that the small mom and pop businesses need to do let's just make it easier and automate it so one of the strong use cases for gen of ai that they were working on was um so if you are a small business owner you know you may be let's say you're running like a t-shirt shop or a shop for candles you run a candle shop uh you are the sole proprietor or you might have two or three employees you're probably running pretty lean uh you don't have the money to afford a full-time designer and a marketing person and all that. And you also like, you can go to Fiverr, but sometimes you just need to send emails like around holidays for holiday promotions. Uh, a lot of that's kind of low value work. And it's like, if you were to try to go hire a contractor to do that, it would just be a lot of effort and money. And so one of the things that uh, MailChimp had offered through their Crave Studio uh product or services forgot you know what the exact name of it but it's crave studio was a uh, okay so leslie of candle of candle shop um she wants to send that holiday email what she can do is she can go into crave studio and say hey i uh you know here's my like website or shop or whatever um generate a bunch of like email templates for me and then, so the first thing it would do is it would generate uh, stock photos and like the color palettes for your email. And then Leslie goes, hey, okay, now, like a lot of people's use cases, give me some templates to write my like holiday, like email, but do it with like my brand in mind. Like, so, so her tone of voice, her style of speaking. Um, and then also like list like other kind of, you know, details about my shop. Uh, then of course it would generate that email copy. Um, and then she's like, okay, I want like several different versions of this so I can like AB test the email. Boom. It would do that again. Right. So the reason why I think it's like such a strong business use case is like, once again, like MailChimp is the largest provide, like, I don't say provider of emails. Uh, they don't, they don't provide emails just in case anyone's listening. They don't provide emails. Um, they are the sender. largest, they Yes, they are the largest secure, <laughs> um, you know, st uh, uh, business for emails, right? So Leslie has an email list that she's already built up. Um, so she can do a couple things, right? Uh, she already has like her email list is segmented out, right? And that's something also that MailChimp offers. So MailChimp allows you to create uh, campaigns based off of like certain triggers that you can customize on your own. They offer a nice little like UI for that. So Leslie has three email lists. She has the high spenders, the medium spenders, and the low spenders. So she can connect the different email templates with those different lists. And essentially she's got that like end-to-end -end automation um, with like that's directly tied into her business. So for me, that was just like a strong business value prop. And a lot of it is because MailChimp had built up, I don't the, the term that's in vogue right now is like defensive moat, but MailChimp essentially built out this defensive moat through like their product and their strategy that they've been working on for 20 years. And so for them, it's like the generative AI like capabilities that they offer, it, it is directly in line with like their, um, their mission statement. And it's also not the product. The product is we're going to make your life like super easy as like a small, medium sized like marketing business owner who might have already built up a, a list of like, you know, 10,000 emails and, and has all like the interactions with their website and their shop. And now they also offer the segmentation and uh, the automation capabilities. You normally have to go to like Zapier or other kinds of site, uh, like other kinds of like providers to do that. So they they just... Yeah, I think MailChimp is just, they are just massively benefiting um, from the new wave. I can't say that for a lot of other companies, you know, and seeing that as like an ML platform engineer, like when I was there, was super exciting because it also kind of exposed me early on to some of the challenges of working with um, like, m not just like multi-model ensemble like pipelines, because we had those there for sure. But also, like, how do you, like, test and validate, like, 
if you're using a generative AI or LLM, like in your uh, system or your model pipeline, like how do you actually evaluate it? How do you monitor it? The big thing that a lot of teams I think get super wrong is actually the data product feedback on their models. Companies and teams really don't understand how to integrate that to kind of further enrich their data science machine learning initiatives and also the products that they're able to offer. Mickey, so uh, funny conclusion is that the greetings we are getting from companies on holidays are not only now, you know, not personalized, but also even the even the the, the body of the, the text is not written by. But they are personalized. personalized. They're personalized to your persona. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I. <laughs> Very interesting for me that uh, company don't know companies don't know uh, how to treat feedback data, mm -hmm. and and I think with uh, generative AI type of problems it is even more challenging. Yeah, because the feedback is is less structured. So can you share with us how it was done at my Mailchimp and who was providing feedback? What type of feedback it was? And what you like, what what your teams were doing with? It. How did it work? Yeah, so I so I I will say that when I left, right, the monitoring initiatives were just getting off the ground. So I we had not. So things that okay, so helpful once again to understand context with Mailchimp, right? So Mailchimp, twenty year old company, they. So they were privately owned, never had any VC funding. Uh, they're still in data centers. They still have physical data centers that they rent and they own server racks, right? Um, they had only started making the transition to cloud um, relatively short time ago, maybe definitely less than eight years ago, maybe closer to six. So very early on, uh, and th this is a great decision that maybe some companies should think about, rather than moving the entire company to cloud, they said, for now, what we'll do is we'll move the, the, the you know, burgeoning data science and machine learning initiatives, including any of the data engineers that are needed to support those. We'll keep everyone else like in, in the legacy stack for now. Um, and then they'll like just slowly start migrating um, like shards right to the cloud and then evaluating that. So because they were privately owned and um, because they had a very kind of clear North Star, they were able to make technology decisions in terms of like years as opposed to like quarters, the way like some tech companies do, right? Um, okay, so what does that mean in terms of the feedback? So there's feedback that's generated through the product data that is uh, serviced back up into like the product itself. So a lot of that was in the core legacy stack. Uh, the data engineers for the, the data science machine learning org, a lot of their role was tasked with uh, bringing over data and copying over data like from the legacy stack over into like GCP, which was where we were living. So the stack there uh, that the data science machine learning folks were using was uh, for GCP, it was like, BigQuery, uh, Spanner, uh, Dataflow, uh, AI Platform Notebooks, which is now Vertex, but it's the Notebooks solution. Um, and then, yeah, I mentioned Dataflow, right? Uh, we were also using uh, Jenkins, Airflow, Terraform. Uh, there's a couple others. So that was a big role of the data engineers there. They were tasked with getting that data over to data science machine learning side. So for the data, data scientists and machine learning uh, folks, there was a latency of about like a day for the data. So at that point, it was very hard to do. Um, we could do live service models, and that was a very common pattern, right? But a lot of the models had to be trained offline. Uh, and then essentially, you know, we created like live service out of them. Expose the API endpoint, all that. But there was a latency of about like 
one to two days. Um, but with that being said, something that they were working on, for example, was, and this is where like the tight integration with product needs to happen. So one feedback that had been given was like, hey, like this creating your campaigns, like what we call the journey builder, this is really cool. But a lot of the small, medium sized like business owners who are like, you know, they're the CEO, they're the CFO, they're like the CMO, right? They're doing it all. They were like, this is actually very, very complicated. Can you suggest like how to build campaigns for us? So that was feedback that came in through product. And then uh, yeah, and then the data scientist in charge of that project uh, was like, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a model that uh, does that. It'll give uh, a recommendation for like, let's say the next three steps or the next three actions uh, an owner can take on their campaign. And then essentially they then worked with like, or we all worked like with the data engineers to basically go like, hey, can we even like get this data? Are there any, um, once again, this is where like legal comes into play. Like, are there any kind of legal restrictions? Um, and then essentially getting that into the data sets that could then be featured into the models. This is type of feedback that it's, le I don't know, it sounds like not data type of feedback, but more qualitative feedback from product based on the needs of users they express, right? So kind of, yeah, dear data science team, maybe we'll figure out how we do. But I, th I think, but I think you need both. But, but I think you need both, you know? And I think you can't have data feedback without product and without like the front end team, right? Because like a very, for example, a, a very common place to get feedback is like when you share like, for example, um, like if you share a recommendation, right? Or for example, like with Twitter ads or whatever, right? Uh, you can say like, is this ad relevant to you? Yes, no, right? It's very simple to actually offer that option in like the UI. And I think like, I think a lot of folks think like, in terms of data feedback, right? Like the implementation is very like easy, which is like anytime someone like, if you, it, okay, actually, when I say easy, it does require a strong understanding of experimentation design. So assuming you have that, right? Uh, there's a lot of tools like A-B test, like predictions and models. And then essentially you can just write the results back to a table, right? That's not actually hard. What is hard is getting a lot of times the different engineering teams to sign on to that to be able to really to, to even be willing to set that up. And then once you have that and you essentially have like the experiment and the website and the model that it was like attached to, like the data part is easy, but I think getting the product buy-in and getting um getting like the engineering or like the business team on board with like, hey, like there is a strategic value to enriching our data sets. So for example, when I was at a uh, data council last week, they had a generative AI panel. And honestly, what I got out of that discussion was uh, actually boring data and ML infrastructure, like matter a lot. They, they matter even more so. Like a lot of this ML ops infrastructure is not gonna go away. In fact, it becomes more important because the big discussion there was like, oh, uh, we are running out of like the public corpus of data to like train and fine tune on. And what they mean by that is we're running out of high quality academic uh, data sets in English, like to actually use our models with. But so people are like, okay, well, what happens if we run out of data sets on the web? Then the answer is like, it goes back to first party data. It goes back to the data that you as a business actually own and can control. It was the same discussion that happened uh, when I think what was it Google said, "Hey, we're going to get rid of the ability to track like third-party data." Like a lot of people were freaking out. It's like actually, if you build that data foundation, if you build that data feedback collection, and you align it with your machine learning efforts, uh, then you're not going to have to be worried. But if you're a company where you're just a thin wrapper around like an open a an open AI API. That's like, yeah, you should be worried because you're not actually delivering value that like no one else could could offer. It's the same with the ML infrastructure, right? I like, think I, the baseline yeah. just went up, but to yeah. 
to be competitive, <laughs> do something on top, you yeah. still need to have something on top, right? Something proprietary, something. Yeah, a hundred percent. And that's actually where I think, I think ML ops engineers and like data engineers sometimes they um, they think too much like engineers. Like sometimes they're not. Can you elaborate more yeah, on that? <laughs> I can elaborate more on that. Uh, a lot of times they think, I don't want to say they, they think the challenges are technical. A lot of times there are technical challenges, but a lot of times what you actually need to get is you need to get time and like, like headroom and investment. And a lot of times that means aligning your conversation with the strategic goals of the business. And I think a lot of data engineers and like, ML ops engineers are not really great with that. I think data scientists oftentimes can be better at that. And so when they make... Because they need to deal with yeah. with business yeah. uh, more often. Yep, right? yep. And the ML ops kind of are not providing direct value, right? But, you know, it's like public health, right? Like everyone undervalues public health until you're dying of like a water contagion issue, right? Like it, it, it is super important. But people don't always surface how important it is. And more importantly, um, a lot of times they approach it from a, this is the the best technical solution, as opposed to this will drive immense value for the company. And companies really care only about like two or three things, right? They care about generating more revenue or more profit, right? Some, you, do, you don't want to generate more revenue, more costs, right? Generate more revenue or profit, uh, cut down costs, or like optimize them and then do some combination of both. So profit. <laughs> oh, yeah, effectively, right? Uh, so if so, if ML ops engineers and data engineers can align their efforts, especially around building an ML stack, right? Because a lot of times like a business person is going to be like, or even like a head of engineering, they're going to be like, why do we need this tool? Like it's just another thing that people here are not going to be using. And the very easy way to, um, oddly enough, the very, a way to kind of, the, the strategy to kind of counter that is uh, one, like think about what KPIs and metrics they care about, show the impact on those. The next part is also offering like a plan of attack and a plan of like maintenance. And the thing that I've observed really successful ML platform teams do is kind of almost counter to the stories that you hear about. So a lot of the stories you hear about building ML platforms, it's like, oh, we created this new thing and then we we brought in this tool to do it. And then people just used it and loved it. It's just another version of the, if you build it, they will come. And that's just not what happens. Like if you actually read between the lines of a lot of like successful ML platforms, what they did was they took on like an area or a stage of the process that was already, um, it was already going, but it wasn't optimal. It was very suboptimal. Like maybe they already had a path to production for like, you know, for deploying machine learning models, but it just really sucked. And so what teams would do is they would build a parallel solution that was just much better. And then they would essentially like, invite or like onboard like data scientists to that path they would do the um the manual stuff associated sometimes with adopting users like the whole you know do things that don't scale um you know do workshops uh you know help them like get their projects through the door the key point is you have to offer something that is actually truly better because when data scientists or users have a baseline of we do this thing already, but it really sucks. And then you offer them something better. Um, I think there's a term called different was a differentiable value or something. Um, you essentially have a user base already of like data scientists that can do more things. So if you go to like a business uh, person or your like CTO and go like, look, we already know we have a hundred data scientists that are trying to push models. This is how long it's taking them. Uh, we can cut, not only can we cut that, that, that time down to half, uh, but we can also do it in a way where they're happier about it and they're not going to quit. And it'll provide X amount more value because these are the initiatives like we want to push. 
and it's going to take us like six months to do it. But we can make sure we can cut down to three months. And then you can show those benchmarks and measurements as well as offer like, hey, this is our like maintenance plan. Like a lot of these conversations, once again, they're not about technical supremacy. Uh, it's about how do you like socialize that initiative? How do you like align it with like your like executive leaders, um, their concerns? And then doing the hard work of like getting the adoption into like the ML platform. So do you have any success stories about it from MailChimp? Like what practices would you suggest in communicating with uh, machine learning teams? How do you get feedback from them? So there's a couple of things that we we did there that we did well. Um, so the first thing like I did when I got to MailChimp or got to that team was, um, so when I was at working at Autodesk as a data scientist slash like data analyst hybrid, um, Autodesk is a design oriented company. So they make you take a lot of classes in like design thinking. Um, so, and how to collect user stories. And that's also something that I had learned also in my anthropology study was like essentially like how do you create what they call like ethnog uh, ethnographies, uh, which is like how do you go to sp how do you speak uh, go to people like learn about their practices, um, understand what they care about, speak in their language. So that was kind of the the first thing that I did there on the team was I landed there was like wow we have all these tickets in Jira we have all these things we could be working on. Um, the team was kind of working in all these different directions. And I was like, okay, first off, let's just make sure we all had the same baseline of like, what's really important. Um, so did a couple things. Uh, one, uh, you know, went back through some of the tickets that we had created, went back through the user stories, uh, talked to the data scientists, talked to the folks on the ML platform team, um, created like a process for how it's like, okay, let's gather this feedback. Let's all independently like score or group the feedback and let's t-shirt size the efforts. Um, and then from there, we could kind of establish like a rough like roadmap or, or plan. After that, then like one of the things we had identified was uh, templating. The, the templating was a little bit confusing. Um, more importantly, so this is around the time the Docker, oh, sorry, um, the M1 uh, Mac was released. It had broken a bunch of stuff on, like for for Docker. Essentially, all our data scientists and part of the templating tool was essentially create a a Docker image, um, populate it with, you know, whatever like configurations based off the type of like machine learning project they were doing. It had broken, and the thing we wanted to get away from was uh, local development. All of our data scientists were essentially doing work in like our AI platform notebooks, and then they would have to like pull down the work locally, and then they would have to push that work back to like a separate like GitHub instance and all sorts of stuff. Like, so we want to kind of really simplify that as much as possible and specifically like to find a way to connect uh, like the AI platform notebook, you create a template like within GCP, and then you can kind of push it out to GitHub, which then would trigger the CI CD, and then also um, eventually trigger the deployment process. So that was a project I worked on. Um, and it, yeah, and it, it looks like it did actually like help. It helps. So I worked on the V1 of that, and then uh, additional folks took it, uh, matured it even further. And so now data scientists don't have to ideally go through that like weird like push pull from like remote to local development um and that was something that to me was just a really fun project because i had kind of had this impression like oh like data science is always like and even myself i'm like oh like yeah like you develop locally but it was a little bit of a disjointed process um and there's like a couple other stuff too but that was yeah that was like the big one that that was a hard process too because we had to go like we had to think about how do we like connect it to Jenkins and then how do we um how do we get around like the VPC and all that so a book that I've been reading recently that I really love is called uh 
Kill It With Fire uh, by Maria. I got to figure out. I can remember, remember her name. But it's about actually how do you like update legacy systems? How do you like modernize them without throwing them away? And so that was a lot of the work I was doing at MailChimp. I was so used to working at startups where you can kind of startups are like companies where the ML initiative was like really new and you have to build everything from scratch that I hadn't understood like, oh, actually when you're building an ML like service or tool for an enterprise company, um, it's a lot harder there. You have a lot more constraints on what you can actually use. So for example, we couldn't use GitHub Actions like at MailChimp. That would be nice, but we couldn't, right? Um, we we had an existing like templating tool and a process that data scientists already were using that once again, it was, it was, it existed, but it was very suboptimal. So how do we then like optimize an offering that they would be willing to actually use? Um, a lot of like learnings from it. But ultimately, like the pace in an enterprise setting is a lot slower than like what you could do either at a startup or even as like a consultant. Um, so that, that's like the one drawback is like a lot of times the number of projects you can work on is like about a third if you're someplace else. But it was it was very fascinating. So I'm very interested in the fact, uh, did the data scientists were the data scientists direct users of your platform or were there also machine learning engineers involved in some way, maybe embedded into the product teams? Yeah, yeah. So um, so there's, there's two answers to that question. One is most of the data scientists, so MailChimp had a very like engineering, it was design and engineering heavy culture. So a lot of the data scientists who were there actually had some prior, the most successful data scientists that were there actually had prior experience as like software engineers. So they could, even if the process was a little bit like rough, a lot of times they were able to find ways to kind of like work with it. Um, but in the last like two, three years, like MailChimp had started hiring sort of data scientists that were more like on the product and business side. So they didn't have experience as like software engineers. Um, they need a little bit of help. So each team essentially that was involved in like MLOps or the ML platform initiative had some kind of like what they call like embedded MLOps engineers that were sort of close. They were kind of close to ML engineering role, but not really. Like essentially, um, they weren't they weren't building the models for data scientists. They were just literally helping with the last mile of productionization. Um, and the way I think of an ML engineer is a full stack data scientist. So you're actually writing up the features. You're also developing the models. So we had folks that were there to help the data scientists get their project like through the process, but they weren't like building the models, right? So our main core users were data scientists. And then they were the only ones, but we had folks that would help them out with like answering tickets, answering like Slack questions, um, helping to like prioritize bugs. And that would be then brought back to, uh, like more of like the, the, en the, 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 the engineering folks that would work on it. Each team had this kind of mix of people that would focus on like developing new features and tools. And then people that had like 50% of their time was assigned to like helping the data scientist. I think by the time I, a few months after I had left though, so Intuit had acquired Mail MailChimp about six months before I left. And it usually takes about that long for changes to actually start kicking in. Uh, I think what they had done was they had restructured the teams so that a lot of the enablement engineers were on one team and then the like platform engineers were like on another team but before when i was there um each team had a mix of both so there were no central ml platform team mm, nope it was essentially split okay. along uh training and development 
and then serving and then like monitoring and integrations. Ah, but it's still it, it, they were called a platform. It's still a central platform team, but yeah, made up of multiple, they... right? Uh, multiple yeah. stream aligned teams, kind of part of platform team, probably providing platform capabilities, <laughs> like in team topologies. Yeah, yeah. Did they share tech stack mm -hmm. and processes, or each ML team with data scientists, platform, if we can call them like that, mm -hmm. and support people? We're having their own realm and having own, you know, tech stack, own processes, or you had some initiative to share some basics. You said templates uh, across teams. Yeah, yeah. So there, yeah. So most of the stack was shared. Uh, I think the team topologies, like way of like describing teams and orgs, I think is actually a fantastic. Uh, it, it's a fantastic way to describe it um, because like, so essentially like, so team topologies, right? There is like, there's like four teams, right? There's the streamlined teams, which in this case is like data science and product, right? You have complicated subsystem teams, which are like the Terraform team or like the Kubernetes team. And then you have uh, enablement and platform, I think are like the last two. So each team was a mix of platform and enablement. So for example, the resources that we did share were um, uh, BigQuery Spanner, like Airflow, right? Uh, but what the difference is, and I think this is something that I think a lot of platform teams actually miss, the goal of the platform team isn't always to like own a specific tool or a specific stack layer. The goal of a platform team, a lot of times, if, if you are so big that you have those specializations, is to piece together not just the existing tool, but occasionally new tools into like a unified experience for your end user. So in this case, for us, it was a data scientist. So for us, even though we shared um, even though we shared like BigQuery and Airflow and all that great stuff, uh, other teams were also using those resources as well. But they might not be interested, for example, in deploying machine learning models to production. Like they might not actually be anywhere involved in that aspect. And so what we did was we said, hey, uh, we're going to be essentially your guides to a lot of these like other internal tools. We're going to like create and provide abstractions. And occasionally we'll also bring in tools that we think are necessary. So for example, uh, a tool that was not used, right, by the serving team was like great expectations. Like they didn't really touch that because it's something that you would mostly use in like dev and training. You wouldn't really use great expectations in production. Um, there were, there are a couple other things too, like uh, kind of like, Kind of not thinking about it right now. Um, yeah, sorry. I like I can't think of them all in my head. But there was like three or four other tools where like the data scientists need to use it in like development and training, but they don't actually need to use it for production. For those, we would like incorporate into like the paths to production, um, or yeah, paths to, to production. And then in terms of like the serving layer, uh, so essentially the serving layer was like a thin Python client that would take the Docker containers or images that were being used for the models. Um, and then it would essentially expose like the API endpoint so that for example, uh, teams like upfront could route like any of the requests to like get predictions from the models. Did you use um, any pipelining tools? Uh, for instance, to, to allow automatic or semi-automatic uh, retraining of a model or the the or data scientists were just training a model packaged it into docker image and and yeah it, it was kind of closed uh yeah so we had projects that were in various stages of automation uh so airflow was a big tool that we used that was just the one that is like across the board uh, everyone in the company uses. 
So the way we interacted with Airflow was we essentially, um, as part of like the template. So a lot of times like Airflow, you have to like go and like write your own DAG and create it. A lot of that stuff can actually be automated. And if it's just running like the same type of um, machine learning pipeline, essentially that was built into like the cookie cutter templating tool. So we said, hey, like when you're setting up your project, you go through a series of like interview questions. Uh, do you need like Airflow? Yes, no. If they mark yes, then essentially that part would get filled out for them um, with like the relevant information on like the the project and all that other stuff. And then they would set the credentials. Um, How did they know whether they need it or not? Yeah, so that is actually uh, something that was part of the work of like optimizing the cookie cutter template is like we kind of didn't like when I got there essentially data science had to like fill out a lot of these questions like do I need airflow do I need xyz and for the most part a lot of times they would have to ask like the enablement engineers almost like hey what what should I be doing like and sometimes there were projects that needed a little bit more of a design consultation like, can we actually support this, like, model or this this system that you're trying to build with, like, the existing um, paths that we offer? And then they would, like, we would kind of, like, help them figure that out. Then they could kind of go on and, like, set up the project. It was a pain when they would set up the project and then we'd look at it and go, no, this is wrong. You actually need to do this thing. And they would have to, like, rerun uh, the project. but. Um, something that we did that was like the optimization was saying, Hey, just, just pick a recipe, like just pick a, pick like a, um, like a, a pattern and then we'll just fill out all the configurations for you. And for most of them, like they're like, they could figure out pretty easily, like, do, is this going to be like a batch prediction job where I just need to copy values? Uh, is this going to be like a live service model? Like th those two patterns were like pretty easy for them to figure out. And so they could like say, hey, like this is what I want. And then they could just use like the image that was designed for that job. And then once again, like the template process would run and then they could just fill out like, oh, this is the project name, yada, yada. Uh, they did have to fill out like the Python version like we would automatically set it to the most stable, like up to date version. But if they needed like 3.2 and Python's at 3.11, then they would specify that. But other than that, at that point, ideally, they should be able to do their jobs of like, okay, now we'll like, you know, write the features, we'll develop the models. Um, the other cool part too was we had also been looking at offering them like native like streamlet support. So that was also a common part of the process as well, where data scientists would create like the initial models and then they would essentially create a streamlet dashboard. They would show it to product and there's this big like streamlet library. And then essentially product would use that go like yes, no. And then they could then like proceed with that project. And more importantly, if like new product folks wanted to join and they were interested in like what model, like how does this model work or what models are offered, what capabilities, they could go to that like streamlit library or the data science could send them the link to it and they could go through and like quickly kind of see like, oh, like this is what that model does. Yeah, it sounds like a UAT environment, right? Uh, user acceptance tests kind of pre-prod I... or maybe tech stack on, on demand, oh. like you, you pick up. You specify what's your project and you're getting yeah. tech stack and configuration. An example how to, you know, similar Yeah, I mean, that's kind of how it should be, right, for data scientists. This, uh, setup. So you are not only providing just, you know, one fits to, for all tech stack for uh, MailChimp uh, ML teams, but they were, they had a selection. They, they were able to. <laughs> but how, how many paths did you support? Because I know that uh, I've heard of a teams that the only job of the team was just baking new template repositories daily, basically, to support like 300 use cases. Mm. 
Yeah, how big was the team and and how many ML models you had? Yeah, so, okay, data science team was uh, anywhere from 20 to 25, I want to say. And then in terms of, like, the engineering side of the house, um, there were six on my team. Might have been six on the serving team. Might have been another six on um, the data integrations monitoring team. And then we had another team that was, like, the data platform team. So they're like very associated with like, like what you would think of a data engineer, right? They would help maintain, like they owned, uh, they didn't own airflow, but they owned like copying the data from MailChimp's like legacy stack over to like BigQuery and Spanner. Um, there was a couple other things that they did, but that was like the, the big, big one. Um, making sure also the data was available for like analytics use cases. Like once again, there, there are people that are using the MailChimp data, uh, that were not like necessarily involved in like ML efforts. Right. So they were responsible for that. That team was another six to eight. So six, 12, 18, 24. So 24 engineers for 25 data scientists, plus however many product and data analytics folks that were using like the the data as well do you understand correctly that it is 18 people in platform team teams throughout the platform teams for 25 data scientists you said um, six six and six so the third team was like they were broken they were spread out across like a number of projects Monitoring was the most recent one, so they didn't actually get involved with like the ML platform initiatives until maybe about, I want to say three months before I left MailChimp. Uh, prior to that, they were working on like data integrations, so they were much more closely aligned with like, like the efforts on like the analytics, like engineering side which are like totally different from the data science side. Um, but yeah, that's about right. And then they also, I think recently they've like hired more data scientists. They've also hired more um, on the, like the platform engineer folks. Um, and I think what they're trying to do is there's a couple things, right? One, they're trying to align uh, MailChimp more closely with like Intuit. Um, yeah, they're trying to align uh, MailChimp with like into, I think, QuickBooks, I want to say specifically. Uh, and then they're trying to like also continuously like build out more like ML capabilities, which is like super important in terms of like MailChimp and Intuit's like long term, like strategic vision. And Mickey, do you remember how many ML models you you had on production at the time? You I think or? minimum was 25 to 30. Yeah. Models on production. Yes. Type of models yep, yep. on production. But they were definitely building out a lot yeah. more. And some of those models were actually ensemble models and ensemble pipelines. So it was a pretty significant mm -hmm. amount. The hardest part that my team was solving for yeah. um, and that I was working on was like solving crossing the chasm between like experimentation to production with a lot of stuff that we worked on while I was there, um, including like optimizing the templating project. Uh, we were able to significantly cut down like setup and the development like environment significantly. So I wouldn't be surprised like if they've, I won't say like doubled that number, but like at least like significantly increased the number of models in production. Um, yeah. Do you remember what was the typical statistic of idea to let's solve this problem using machine learning to having it solved on <laughs> by yeah, machine learning so... production? What was that, you know, median it average was time? on the order of, so I, I don't like the measuring from idea. Um, I, because there's a lot of things that can happen on like the product side, but assuming everything went well, mm -hmm. 
um, with the product side. And for example, they didn't change their minds. Um, and assuming the data scientists weren't like super overloaded, uh, it might still take them a few months. And largely it was doing things, for example, like validating logic was a big one. Um, getting like product buy-in. Yeah. And validating logic. Yeah. Like, so for example, like, like uh, validating, logic. like the data set, uh, by validating, I don't mean like quality. I mean like mm -hmm. semantic understanding, um, creating like a bunch of different models, creating, uh, like different features, um, you know, sharing that model with like the prog team and with the other data science folks, making sure that we had the right architecture to support it. Yeah. Um, and then for example, things like if their model needed uh, like a GPU support, making sure that our Docker images could support that. So it would take at least uh, a couple months and a huge part of that was, yeah. And I was, I was about to ask what was the, the key factors? Like what took the biggest yeah, I time? Think the biggest times were initially it was like struggling with the end 10 experience. So like going back to the, like it, it was a bit rough, right. To have actually different teams, like kind of, and that was like the feedback that we had gotten and that I had kind of collected when I first got there was essentially data science would go from like the dev training environment, the team, and then they would kind of like sort of, they would, they, they would then go into like serving and in, in deployment and they would then have to kind of like work with a different team. And so that was like one piece of feedback was like, Hey, like we have to essentially jump through all these different hoops and it's not like a super unified experience. Um, and then I think the other part that they struggled with too was like sometimes the um it was like the strategic roadmap of like for example it felt like when i got there that like different people were working on completely different projects and sometimes it wasn't even visible like what that project was and sometimes even too like the project was less about how useful was it for the data scientists and it was much more like did the engineer on that project want to work on it? Like, was it their pet project? And so there was a bunch of those. Yeah. Um, so, but by the time I had left, um, I think, so the staff, uh, so the tech lead there, uh, Emily, she is super awesome. And she's done like some awesome talks about how to enable data scientists with GPUs, uh, Emily Kern. So working with her was fantastic. My manager uh, at the time, Nadia Morris, uh, who's still there as well, um, between like the three of us and the work of a few other folks, we were able to actually get better alignment in terms of the roadmap to really actually start like steering all the efforts towards like providing that more like unified experience so that like, so for example, like there are other practices too, where like some of these engineers who like had their pet projects they would kind of build something like over a period of like two, three nights. And then they would like ship it to the data scientists without any testing, without any whatever. And they'd be like, oh yeah, like data science, you have to use this. Yeah. It is they would be like, oh yeah, data science, you have to use this. It's like, wait, why didn't you? Okay. It's like, why didn't you first off have us give, like have us create a period of, of testing internally. And then you know, now we need to like help the data scientists because they're having all these like problems with these like pet project, you know, like pet project tools. Like we could, <laughs> we could have like buttoned it up. We could have made sure it was free of bugs. And then we could have set up like, like an actual enablement process where, you know, we like create some tutorials or write-ups or we host like office hours. We like show it off. Um, and sometimes, and a lot of times, the data scientists would be like, they'd look at it and they'd be like, yeah, we're not using this. Like, we're just going to keep doing the thing we're doing. Because even if it's suboptimal, it's at least not broken. 
was there any case where something was created inside of a stream aligned team that was so good that you decided to pull it into the platform as a capability? Um, that's a pretty good question. I don't, I don't think so, but a lot of times the data scientists, especially there were some senior ones who were really good at like, they would go out and try out tools and then they would come to the team and say like, hey, like this looks like really interesting. Like, I think that's pretty much what happened with, um, at the time they were looking at Y Labs, for example. Hmm. Um, and like, that's, I think how that had happened. Uh, there was a few others, but for the most part, A lot of times, we so we had to kind of set up this, I don't say policy, but we had to kind of do this thing where we were like, look, we are building a platform for um, to make everyone's lives easier. And sometimes that means sacrificing a little bit of newness. And so for the most, and I think this is in some ways where like sometimes platform teams get, get it wrong, is like... I, I like, so Spotify had a blog post about this, about like golden paths, right? So they had a golden path, a silver path, and like a bronze path or a copper path or something. The golden path was like the supported, blessed. If you have any issues with this, like this is what we support. This is what we maintain. If you have any issues with this, we will prioritize that bug. We will fix it. And it will work for like 85% of use cases, 85 to 90%. The silver path is like, it includes elements of the golden path, but there are some things that are just like not really, we don't directly support, but we are consulted and informed on. And if we think we can like pull it into the golden path, then we will, but there has to be like enough use case for it. And so at that point, it then becomes a conversation about where do we split engineering sources? Because there are times, for example, like there are some projects, uh, for example, like Creative Studio, right? It is super innovative. It was also very hard to support. Um, but it's also if MailChimp says like, hey, we need to offer like we need to use generative AI to essentially like help streamline uh, our product offering for our users then that I think that then becomes a conversation of like, Hey, uh, how much of like our engineers time can we like open up or free up to do work on this system? And even then with that, those set of projects, I don't think I, I there's not as much difference in terms of like infrastructure support that's needed as people would think. Like, I think especially with like Generative AI and like LLMs, I think where you get the biggest like infrastructure and operational impact is like latency is a huge one. Uh, second part is like data privacy. That's a really, really big one. Um, and then the third is like the monitoring and the evaluation piece. But for a lot of the other stuff like upstream, it would still line up with like, for example, like an NLP based like recommendation system. Like that's not really going to significantly change as long as you have the right like providers providing the right needs. So we had like a golden path, but you could also have like some silver paths like that. And then you had people that would go off and kind of just like go and do their own thing. Like we, we definitely had that. Like we had the cowboys. And cowgirls and cow people. Yeah. They would go off road. And at that point, it's like, uh, you can do that, but it's not going to be in production on like the official like models in production, right? And you you try your best, but I think that's also like when you see that, you have to kind of look at it as a platform team and going like, is it because of this person's personality that they're doing that? Or is it truly because there's like a friction point in our tooling? And if you only have like one or two people out of 25 doing it, it's like, eh, it's probably the person. It's probably, it's probably not the platform.
And, and it sounds like a situation where your education comes to the picture. <laughs> you cannot... <laughs> And you know, <laughs> yeah, so we're actually kind of already 19 minutes past our agreed time. So I don't know, maybe before closing uh, the episode, maybe Miki, you have some thoughts that you want to leave our listeners with. Maybe uh, you want to say where we, they can find you online. Yeah, sure. So uh, folks can find me on uh, LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, I have a Substack that I've been neglecting, but I'm going to be revitalizing that. So folks can find me on Substack. Um, I also have a YouTube channel. I am also revised. I'm also revitalizing that, so people can find me there. Um, in terms of like other last thoughts, so I know there's like a lot of people have a lot of anxiety about they have a lot of ex anxiety and excitement about all the new things that have been going on in the last six months. Uh, some are, some people are worried about their jobs. Yeah. Foundational malls. Um, but there's also like, there's a lot going on in the ML space. Uh, so I would, my advice to people, my advice to people would be, uh, one, uh, all the boring ML and data infrastructure and knowledge is uh, more important than ever. Uh, so that it's always great to have a strong skill set in um, data modeling, in uh, coding, in um, you know testing, in best practices. That will never be devalued. Uh, the second word of advice I'd leave people is like, regardless of whatever title you are, you want to be like, focus on like getting your hands on projects, uh, really understanding the adjacent areas and, uh, yeah, learn to speak business because I, if I were to be really honest, like I'm not the best engineer or data scientist out there. I'm like, I'm fully aware of my weaknesses and strengths, but the reason I was able to kind of make so many pivots in my career and the reason I was able to get as far as I did is largely because I try to understand the domain and the teams I work with, especially the the revenue centers or the profit centers is what people call it. So that is like super important. Uh, that's a skill that people skill and, and body of knowledge that people should pick up so, uh, yeah, and people should share their learnings on social media. Like, it'll get you jobs and sponsorships. So, thank you for your thoughts and thank you for dedicating your time to speak with us. It was really amazing. And thank you to everyone who has listened and see, and we'll see you in the next episode. The ML Platform Podcast was brought to you by Neptune AI. If you'd like to learn more about ML platforms and ML ops, check our blog at neptune.ai slash blog, follow us on LinkedIn, or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also, check out how we help teams solve ML ops challenges with our experiment tracking at neptune.ai. To get notified of future episodes, follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening, and see you next time.